Loon Press Fiction A Tale to Remember by Lee Sheridan In my middle age, I was a man well known and regarded around the town, particularly amongst the local women for my, Lord excuse my language, hard loving. I can tell you now that those days are well and truly over, and I have been cursed with a variety of ailments for all my sins, gout, gallstones and gonorrhea to name a few. There are several more that are worth mentioning. Arthritis, anxiety, chlamydia, diarrhoea, diabetes, type 1, type 2, chicken pox, cold and flu. When I consider all these things, coupled with my senescence, I realise that I haven't much time left on this planet. With great difficulty, and with the aid of a stick, I slowly hobble over to a seat and wince as I lower my bony bum onto it. I turn to face my dear grandson, and solemnly look into his eyes for a moment. Son, I have something to tell you about my past. It is not a nice story, but it is important, and you need to hear it from me. I won't be around for much longer, and I don't want you to have any illusions about the kind of man that I was. His countenance switches from vacant to concerned rather quickly. A boiled sweet is produced from my pocket, Offered to the boy, rejected, unwrapped, and subsequently inserted into my crooked old mouth. As the situation is a sober one, I stare into the distance with roomy eyes for an amount of time that I deem to be appropriate before reluctantly beginning my story. Many years ago, I used to do the meter readings for the ESB, as I'm sure you know. Well, you might have known it as my main occupation, but I can tell you that in my estimate... It was, in every which way, a nixer. The real work, for which I was sometimes slipped a few pound for, if the job was done well, was fraternising with the women and wives whose families and husbands were off at school or work. Terrible, I know, but you must hear me out on this. The grandson's eyes widen in surprise. The sense of shame grows in me. I persist with my story. One day in particular made me think twice about this whole operation that I was running. It was a cold, bitter day. The wind was howling and the rain was pouring. My first stop that afternoon was Mrs Higgins's. God rest her. She was devoid of any genuine hip bones, but she had savage torque. God bless her. Anyway, smut aside, when all was said and done and I was gathering my things to head on my merry way, I glanced out of the bedroom window. It was a bungalow that I was in now, mind, and I could see out into the back garden, and through all the blustery wind and rain, I could see a terrible thing. A dark figure, hunched, with deathly grey hands and long wet hair that covered its face. It looked to be a woman, and she was standing there in the garden, and though I couldn't see her eyes, I knew she was looking straight in at me. The grandson's eyes grow wider still. I continue my tale, my tone becoming even more gravelly and sinister, the boiled sweet connecting with my teeth as I talk. I tried to ignore your one anyway. I collected my things and got out of there fast. I don't even think I read the meter in the end. Nevertheless, I made my way over to the next house, Mrs. O'Flaherty's, God rest her. I went about my duties, though halfway through I was compelled by some mysterious force that I could neither resist nor comprehend to glance out at the bedroom window and down into the garden below. And there she was again, same as before, this evil hag of a creature, looking up at me with that menacing stare. She frightened the bejesus out of me, and I nearly let out a scream. Needless to say, my worried mind was unable to focus on the task at hand, and I was forced to retire from the house without gratuity. By now, the grandson looks incredibly uncomfortable, even somewhat frightened. I feel the same, but I am determined to finish the story. So, I jump into the van and start tearing down the road. But after maybe a quarter of a mile, I realise that something is not right. The van is lopsided. I exit the van to check, and my suspicions are confirmed. One of the tyres is flat. Protruding from the tyre on the passenger side is a screwdriver. With the rain lashing down at me, I reef open the doors of the van and pull out the spare. But something happens at that moment. Something that shakes me to the very core. So much so that I drop the tyre by my feet. A scream rings out. A 
frightening scream, long and shrill. I look in the direction of the sound and see the haunting figure as it sprints with great pace up the road. My God, I think, blessing myself. There's no doubt about it. It's the Banshee. Whether she was coming to warn me of death or take my life, I did not know. Either way, any sight of her was bad. But she bound fearlessly up the road, screaming and wailing all the while, and me there falling onto my knees with tears in my eyes. I stopped talking for a moment to gather myself. Do you know what happened next? I ask. The boy shakes his head. Well, let me tell you. I spoke to her. Do you know what I said? The boy shakes his head again. I said, Are you going to kill me? Yes, she says. I told her that I was saved, that I wasn't afraid of her. She said, You had better be afraid of me. I asked her who she was and what she wanted with me. She said, What do you mean, who I am? I'm your wife! A bus loudly rose up in front of myself and the grandson. He glances awkwardly at me, then at the bus, and then back at me, before finally standing up to leave. Where are you going, Declan? I ask. Declan, he says. Who's Declan? My grandson, I say. I'm not your grandson. Ah, I exclaim. I realise now that there was one last ailment that I had forgot to add in the aforementioned list. Dementia. 